Mark's gonna rip me off. Ice, 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 ice. This is it right here. Head of a man, body of a lion. This is what um, we call the Sphinx now. And that was not the original name. The original name is Urim Akin. That's the Sphinx and that's the Great Pyramid in the background. You good? Jim, yeah, brother, what's the deal? How's it going? Single photo. Masterpiece. Good luck, take single photo. Background point the space. I give it to I'm showing you the outside of the Valley of the Kings. We have 64 tombs that are buried. Yeah, those are uh, those devils wouldn't let me take revolutionary cam in there, and they wouldn't let me definitely take a camera or a camcorder inside the tombs. So you know, I'm just giving you outside look, but you know. It was incredible. It was incredible in there. It's some of the most incredible artwork that you'd ever see in a lifetime. The Valley of the Kings. Yesterday and today. In the mountains, you can see lots of gold there. Uh, Egypt it was a rule, especially during the new empire, for noblemen, courtiers, dignitaries, and priests to be buried where the king is buried. So, right here on the right hand side, all the holes in the mountains, these are what is so called the value of the nobles or the noblemen's tomb. And you can see all these colored houses, these are the alabaster factories. And you see that they're beautifully colored. And some of them, they have uh, paintings of camels, or an aeroplane, or a ship. That means the big man, or the old man of this house, has done his pilgrimage to Mecca, or the pilgrimage in Saudi Arabia, as a Muslim. Of course, he didn't use a camel to go over there, it's just symbolic. I never wouldn't let me take my cam for to the valleys of the king and definitely wouldn't let me take any pictures in there. I mean, the artwork in there was just incredible. All right, you guys have a good I mean, time. the color, the precision. Don't stay any more than 40 minutes because we still have a lot to see. Check out my sister negotiating skills. So when it comes to Egypt, you better have your negotiating skills together. So I'll keep you in mind. If I don't Arabs, they will get you. Negotiate sister. Four dollars. Four dollars. I'm Nubian. I'm not American. Nubian? It's up to you. Nubian. We same. We same. We same. We same. We same. Right? Look at that. The same color. We same. You're Nubian, right? Yeah, this Nubian. Yo, you are saying that? Egyptian. Egyptian. I have no Egyptian money. U.S. U.S. Seven. Six. Six. Five. Five. No, that's sex. Six. It's sex. No, it's sex. Six. You like this horse? 
make this mask? What's the name of the statue right here? That one? I'm yeah. in men. Huh? I'm in men. And then, what does uh, that symbolize? Hello, Can you break it down? This is my copy. Huh? Okay, for 20. For 20. Oh, baby, you gotta work with me, huh? Take a present for a friend. We are on top of the temple. It is incredible out here. This was... Wallet, can I ask a question? So, Who is so, the wife of the, the, the lead of the, of the land of Pan? Because I heard that she's very distinguished with a big backside. She is right back to <laughs> but you can see it from here. You can't see it, okay. okay. No, let me show you. Me, you might be able to. Of course, who would make the offering? Queen Hachutu. She was supposed to be standing over there, but you can see that mm. she was totally chiseled away by the order of the most of the Take a look at the ceiling and see the blue color which is Ghanis Nud, the guides of the sky. And of course the souls are the soul of the stars are the soul of the great sisters. She is wishing here to join them when she dies. Around you will see a frieze of cobras on the top. That's not a regular cobra. It's a cobra with two horns and a solar disc between them. It's a goddess, her name was Miri Secrets, meaning the one that live tranquility. She is one of the goddesses of the cemetery, the cobra. And of course, as she was the daughter of God Imra, according to her story, the story she invented, she cannot forget her father. So next to Anubis, she made over there, offering to her father, right there. Wow. So, this is God Amon Ra, featured by a crown that has two long feathers on it. And of course, the different kinds of offering, on the left hand side, we Hatshepsut was supposed to be there, but as you can see, chiseled away. Besides these two gods, of course, some other important gods had to be mentioned, like Horus over there, the protector of the kingship, or Osiris, the god of the hereafter, the god who judges the deceased, has to be mentioned as well, and of course, Anubis again. Anubis. I feel I don't feel right. <laughs> Actually, the third level was totally destroyed, of course, by the orders of Moses the third. And this, when when this place was excavated. The lower part, which is this part, and the other part down there were open for the visitors. The upper part, as it was totally destroyed, was closed for 52 years. They worked on the restoration of this place 52 years. And actually, it was reopened only two years ago. They didn't really did a great job for the reliefs, but for the structure itself, they did a great job. First, you can see statues for Queen Hatshepsut in a, a position called the Uzzurite position, like God Osiris, as a mummy holding the two royal insignia, the crook and the flail. Besides the two royal insignia, the crook and the flail, she is also holding two other things. The scepter of prosperity and the symbol of life is the ark. So she is holding four things together, two in each hand. Those statues are original. Yes, mainly original. They were collapsed, so they had to just erect them again. The entrance itself to the open court behind it, the entrance is very beautiful, a fine piece of art. But this one after was made by Tutmos the Third himself. So you see the names of Tutmos the Third on the entrance, which is carved out of pink granite. Pink granite. When you go over there, so go take a look. I'll be waiting for you. Let's say ten minutes and come back. To us. You're not gonna lead us up. Hmm? I'm on the top level of Queen Achetsut Temple.
Live on Revolutionary Cam, Egypt 2004, a free your mind of mental slavery production. We're in Luxor, Egypt, at Queen Atshepsut Temple, and you can see beautiful artwork, great statues. I've got all those already, over and over. Yeah. Check this out on the inside. Okay. Sir. So, two beautiful sisters here. Oh. They're just having a this wonderful time. And my brother right here. You're Nubian? You're Nubian? All right. Please. Please. Okay. So, as you can see. Bye -bye. Even though Court it's been yeah. damaged a little bit, the history has been preserved and masterpiece of artwork on the writings on the wall. And these are, you can obviously see that these are creation of our ancient African ancestors. You know, I got, I got to get me a, um, a copy of that. I got to get your email and stuff, player. Yeah, man, no, we just got to share the information, that's what it's all no about. No doubt, no doubt. This is the holy of all holies. As usual, like I always say for those uh, devils trying to prevent us from getting more of our history, so for some reason we can't go in there. I can just, oh, this is but it is just, I can just imagine how beautiful it is in there. Oh, this zoom is quite good. This zoom is nice. All right. Thank you. Sign up, player. Sign up, sign up. All right, brothers and sisters, I'm about to go back down there, down to the bottom of the temple, and get some more footage and take some more pictures, and we will uh, get right back to you. Black Power. Peace. <laughs> You know, you know, we don't burn. We got melanin, forty-five. That shit protects us from the sun. Right. But they got a pillar now called Mellow Tan, and it gives you an instant tan. It protects you from being burnt. It makes you very, very better than Viagra. That's the pill they So it's going to protect those devils from yes. sunburn? Those yeah. devils are they just trying to... They just themselves with melody. We got it natural. We got it don't natural. don't need no chemicals, we don't need no pills. I think it's one of those things that's going to come back and haunt them, because you know, yeah. you reap what you sow. I mean, not it, it, they're always tampering with nature. Yeah. Damn you devils. Goddamn devils. Hey, you got me on that tip now. <laughs> Yeah, you're on Revolutionary Cam, a free amount of mental slavery production, Egypt 2004, a documentary by O'Neill Brown. I'm keeping it real. I'm just bringing you everything I can. Yeah, whole tip, African. <laughs> Say hi, everybody. It's our little Charlie. Hi, everybody. It's a security. Look at that big gunny guy. He's going to damage something. Uh oh, it's rolling out, it's rolling out. Send your one, send your one, send your one. We are outside of the alabaster factory. This is where they do handmade artwork. Abu from Basan for Alabaster. That's Dr. Renoko Rashidi, a renowned historian. Alright. This is this is beautiful. Around the area, let us say about 10 miles deep in the mountains. 
Alabasa, they come in three colors, white, brown, and green. Green is the most rare. That's why it is the most expensive alabaster. Actually, we have two kinds of alabaster, either handmade or man-made. Handmade or machine-made. The stones are rolls, different size, like that. Then they start shaping them, like this kind of a hammer, like this. What do you like this? Shaping it outside using the hammer like this. And then you need to make a hole in it. So to stress the stone, you have to wrap it with glued linen. Then after that, they bury it in the ground so it will be steady, not to have any cracks or not to be broken. Then they start working on it with drills like this. And for bigger pieces like this one, you have drills like that, even bigger size, to make a big hole in it. Then when it's done, they take it and they fire it. Like that. After that, they put it in our inferno under them. Then they use limestone and they start rubbing it to smooth it. Then put it in the oven for about two hours. They take it out and they wax it. And that is the final result right here. This is the handmade alabaster and this is the machine made alabaster. I want to show you the difference. Of course, this is the best to be used as lamps. See the difference in size and in, in, in weight? Yes. See this one? Heavy. Woo. Big difference. Very heavy. Yeah, big difference. This one takes about four to five days to be finished. This one takes about an hour to be done. That's why, of course, the, the handmade ones are more expensive than the machine made ones. Take a look if you like and follow me. Oh, no, you're good, you're good. We're inside the Alabaster store. Give me a view of some of the solid artwork. We've got to put this on revolutionary cam. The, the yeah. brothers say you look like you've been fighting for Bush. <laughs> and we're talking about George Bush, the number one terrorist in the world, from the United That's Snakes right. of America. United Snakes. The United Snakes right. of America. United Snakes, but you know, George Bush is all about the red, black, and the green. Like that, that press say. Revolutionary, but gangster. We ain't fighting for Bush. Do you think Bush is the number one terrorist in the world? Without a doubt. Huh? No doubt. And what about Tony Blair? Is he number two? He's number two. So Bush and Tony awesome. they related? Bush is us, hopefully. You think Bush and Tony Blair trying to take over the world? Trying to. Uh, European imperialism. European imperialism. No doubt. What, 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 uh, what do the... These are two... These are... Uh, what do the people in London think about Bush and Tony Blair? They don't like them at all, but nobody, they, it's only for a short period of time. After that short period of time, they have to them, they have them back in again. What do you think about the number one terrorist in the world, George W. Bush? Do you think he's going to get re-elected? I 
I doubt it, man. I'm gonna blow this punk ass out of the office. You may think it'll be a vote, but he counted. <laughs> we, we gonna get together and we gonna vote you out of office. Vote, vote won't get Bush out of office. Vote didn't get him in, vote won't get him out. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a very, that's a real statement. Well, you know, one, one, is more, one is a higher class terrorist and one is a lower class terrorist. So, I'll go with the lower class terrorist, Kerry. I think, you know, he's been out in the war and he knows what, he knows not nothing nice. Bush, Bush never seen a day of war in his life. Not one day. No. And if he did, he'd been running scared. Coward. <laughs> Alright, we're talking about the war on terrorism. Uh, some of my brothers that are war on terrorism used to start over 500 years ago when these white devils from Europe and these white devils from America was taking our brothers and sisters from Africa to help build their nation in Europe. And the hurt area. Now that now that they are reaping what they sow, and they got a new breed of so-called enemies, they want our help. They want the black man to unite with them, with their military, and fight against the wrong terrorism. It's more push. We're coming for you. We're gonna get out. We're gonna get you in the office. You're not, you're not taking us down with you. This is not our war. This is your war. And if you want to go fight, you get you and your sons get up and go fight the enemy, the so-called enemy, and take care of that black power. Diana. We are in Ramseyum, the museum of Ramsey the Great, Ramsey the Second. So this is unbelievable. I guess later on we're gonna find out the uh, one to the heads. I don't know if the devils uh, knocked them off or but we'll find out. But it is incredible in here. Like I always say, the writings are on the wall. If you want facts, this is facts. First of all, remember when we were at Memphis yesterday? I talked about the biggest statue, right? Yes. Remember. See the truth? Oh How big they are? They are over there. And this is part of the second. That's the shoulder. That's the shoulder. And the feet are right there. How tall was it now? It was 57 feet. 57 feet high. 1,000 tons of one piece of granite. It was carved out of one piece of granite. One piece of granite, yes. So those people weren't joking, huh? No mistakes about it. And of course, we believe in one of the earthquakes by the 16th, 17th century, destroyed it and collapsed. Earthquake, all right. Uh, this is the funerary temple of Ramesses II that we were supposed to, he was supposed to be mummified and commemorated after his death and serving his soul through this temple. Of course, after his death, he was mummified, buried in the Valley of the Kings. His tomb is empty and his mummy was found among us what is so-called at Deir al-Bahari cache, near the temple of Queen Hatshepsut, we found a cache where we have about 16 mummies. There was another one in the Valley of the Kings itself, about 40 mummies. So altogether, like 54 mummies were found for kings. 16 and the rest in one place. One moment, please. Oh. Okay, Ramses II. Uh, was founded in one of these caches. And actually, uh, a king, his name was Amen Hotem, he found that his great successor, his uh, uh, predecessors, uh, actually were neglected. And the mummies were just thrown outside their own place. So he collected them and placed them in one uh, tomb, and he labeled each one of them enable each one of them, which helps us a lot to know which mummy belongs to which. 
king. Uh, Ramses II, one of the greatest kings of ancient Egypt, ruled for 67 years. He ruled a very big empire, a vast area, and he was a great warrior, actually. Uh, but his ego was really, really strong. <laughs> really. Uh, we believe that he might have been the pharaoh of the Exodus. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe. I would say 85% he was. Uh, he had many, many wars, many battles, but his real famous battle was the Battle of Kadesh. Mm -hmm. Fighting the Hittites. The Hittites, who are nowadays forming Turkey. They were a growing power. They were threatening the Egyptian Empire. And they started at the time of his father, Siri I. And his father had some kind of maneuvers with them, but the real war came at the time of Ramesses II. Ramesses II had to prepare a very big army of 20,000 soldiers. The first king in the ancient period to start what is so-called military mobilization. <laughs> and the, the, the one who did it in the modern period was Napoleon Bonaparte, imitating Ramesses mm -hmm. II, of course. And he divided his army into four regiments. He gave him the name of gods. Ra, Sakar, Ra, Horakti, and so on. And he was the leader of the first regiment. And he made like half a day between each one of them, marching towards Asia Minor, fighting the Hittites. They were by the Orontes River. They were supposed to be by the Orontes River. But the Hittites were so small. Besides, they were so powerful. Very strong nation, actually. They were so smart. The king was so smart. Played the trick on Ramesses II. On purpose, he let two of his soldiers to be captured by the Egyptian soldiers. And over there, you see, the Egyptian soldiers are giving them a beat using some sticks mm -hmm. to tell them the information about the army of the Hittites. Of course, what happened is they gave him the information, but they gave him the wrong information. They told him that the Hittites are about a day away from the Orontes River while they were just behind the Orontes River. Ramesses II got this information, he didn't wait. He just took the first regiment before the second regiment. Oh, by the way, he did one thing. Ramesses II was so smart, also he did another thing. He moved the four regiments from the Delta area toward Asia. And the special forces, the ancient Egyptian Green Berets, had ah. to go by the coast to meet together in a certain point. And that really helped him or saved his life later on. Ramesses II took this regiment and they started crossing the Orontes River to go for the Hittites. While they were crossing, the Hittites appeared and they started killing the Egyptian army. Actually, the first regiment was about to be destroyed completely, but Ramesses II did something very strange that the Hittites themselves did not expect that. He unleashed his lions and he marched toward the, the enemies by himself. They were surprised. They, they, they were, if, you, if you are in the, the position of the Hittites, you'll think that the, the Ramses II will turn around and, go and run away. No, he did the opposite completely. Unleashed his lions, the lions broke the lines of the, ar the lines of the army. Ramses II himself, followed by a couple of his leaders, saw a kind of confusion happen in the lines of the Hittites. By accident, at the same time, the special forces arrived. So that's how Ramesses II was saved. His, his regiment was about to be wiped off completely. He was about to be killed. So the, the special forces arrived and it was a KO for the enemies. They retreated back. The two armies waited distance. They started re-preparing their own uh, army, uh, their own lines, and then the real battle started. Actually, what helped the Hittites to stand in the face of the Egyptians that they had a better chariot? The, the, the Hittite chariot actually was the tank of that period. The, the Hittite chariot was led by three soldiers, while the Egyptian one was led by two soldiers. Actually, they kept on fighting for a long time, and finally, the two kings realized that there will be no victory for any of them. So they decided to have a conciliation. Stop the war, sign a treaty, let us be friends. They became allies. And Ramesses II married the daughter of this king. And the Egyptians and the Hittites became very strong ally allies. They even fought together against other enemies from Asia. But both kings, of course, they had to show that they were the, the victorious kings. Ramesses II recorded that he defeated the Hittites. The, the copy of the Hittites over there telling that we have crushed the Egyptians. But <laughs> they both were liars, actually. <laughs> None of the armies won any part of this war.
Yeah. Usually, Ramesses II had to repre represent this kind of events on his on the walls of his uh, constructions, like what we have here. The soldiers are receiving the beat. Ramesses II in the training camp. The soldiers behind him, fanning him off. Of course, everybody should be represented in a smaller scale as a respect for Ramesses II. His military chariot in front of him. His two horses are so strong that needs three men to control them. And over there, you see the battle. The line of Ramesses II over there. Usually, the battle shows the Egyptians very well organized and the enemies are in chaos. That means they are not very well organized. For the Egyptians, anybody else was perfect. People are not organized, not very well organized. That's why usually in the, uh, in the battles, Egyptians are very well organized. The enemies are scattered all over the place. But when they are captured, they brought to Egypt, they start walking in organized roles. So now we are going to teach them how to be, this, how to have discipline, how to have organization to walk in roles. As captives, yes, but they have to learn organization. So this is one of the reliefs which shows the Battle of Karish. The Battle of Karish actually is represented on this temple, on the temple of Luxor, and the temple of Abu Simbel for those who will be visiting the temple of Abu Simbel. Let's go this way. First, the one to the right hand side at the bottom, Ramesses II kneeling before the triad of Luxor. The triad of Luxor where? The one to the left with the two long feathers on his head, God Amon Ra, the king of gods, his wife Mut and their son Khonsu, the god of Mut. And over there behind Ramesses II, this is God Tot, the Ibis, the god of wisdom and writing, and he is writing the names of Ramesses II. Behind him, he's been led by Horus, and held by God Atum, the perfect, the creator of all gods. And down below there, you see the sons of Ramesses II, or some of the sons of Ramesses II, the important sons of Ramesses II, their names in front of them, and he cannot decide their lot as kids. Let's say below 15, below 16, they were represented with the side hair lock. Here, matching himself with Osiris or identifying himself as Osiris. Why is that? Eternity, resurrection. And behind him, but higher, of course. This is God Atom, or Tom, the perfect, the creator of all gods, the creator of the universe. And he is writing the name of Ramesses II on one of the leaves of this tree. The name of this tree is the Eshid tree. It is known as the tree of life, but actually it's the tree of eternity. So he is writing the name of Ramesses II on one of the leaves of the tree of eternity. And in front of him, goddess Anthus, the goddess of construction and the wife of Khnom. Khnom, he is the god of the fifth cataract, the main source of the Nile. She is writing the name again on another leaf. Behind her, God taught, the god of wisdom and writing, he is writing the name on another leaf. Not that. Atum is higher than Ramesses II because he is the mighty god. Of course, Ramesses II should be lower. But notice that his feet is above the feet of the other two gods. Mm -hmm. He's giving himself a kind of more importance than other gods. So he is, yes, lower than Atum, but more important than the other gods. And one, this is one of the reasons we say that Ramesses II was the pharaoh of the Exodus, as one of the main struggles between Moses and the pharaoh of the Exodus is that he, was, he claimed that he was a complete god. You see, they were that in the Old Kingdom. Stop in the Middle Kingdom, in the New Empire, the main one who claimed that strongly was Ramesses II. Okay, so uh, that's why he constructed the temple of Abu Simbel, away from the power of the priests of God, Amun Ra. So he is showing himself more important than other important gods. In ancient Egypt, we have recorded 645 gods. 
of course, not all of them were great and mighty. Let us say 15 or 20 were the biggest of them. These two were two of the of the 20. Actually, but Ramesses II, by leveling his feet above their feet, showing that he is more important than these two. Okay? So what kind of temple? Generate them. Okay. Uh, Ramesses the third, actually, I would say, the last great pharaoh, the Wenius dynasty. After him came the late period for 10 dynasties, except the 26th dynasty. And that's the Ethiopian dynasty who gained back the fame of the empire for a while, and then declination came back again. This man was a great king, and he had to defend the empire again against another power. This time we called them the Sea People. The Sea People, they were consisted of different people coming from different islands in the Mediterranean like the area of Cyprus and the area around it. They had different names like Sherdana, Tullus, and so maybe later on formed Palestine, Sardinia as well, and the other islands around the Mediterranean. Uh, a very big battle, and he also was so smart, so he did something very big with them. I'm gonna show it to you when you go further inside this temple. But first, on both sides, notes we have statues for the lioness headed goddess, goddess Sekhmet. Segments, the goddess of war. Actually, have you heard of goddess Hathor? Yep. The cow-headed goddess. Mm -hmm. According to the story, or according to the myth of the destruction of mankind, Hathor, when she is angry, she is Segment, the lioness-headed goddess, the goddess of war. So that's Hathor in her angry form. Mm -hmm. The lioness-headed goddess, goddess Segment, and she was the wife of Gadbeta the great god of Memphis, the creator, one of the creators, the god of darkness, the protector of art and artists. One of the great gods, the greatest god of ancient Egypt, and he's one of the gods inside the shrine of the great temple of Absin. Ramesses II loved the Syrian area very much. Third, Ramesses III, of course, sorry. And he was very much affected with their construction. That's why, usually, in an ancient Egyptian temple, the first thing we see, two pylons. Before the two pylons, he built that thing, which is known to us as the Syrian Tower, imitating the constructions of the Syrians at that time, around 1100 BC. This way. Okay, this is a very important place here. So it's the shrine of Arminartis, the Nubian princess, during the 26th dynasty. And that's the dynasty that gained the power of the empire after it was occupied and ruled by the Libyans and others. And here you can see, that's her. Come closer to the most the facial feature. She belongs to the dynasty of Taharqa, Tanut Amani, and the rest of them. So it is dedicated to the gods right here by this princess. And Armin Artis. And right here, you see this offering table shaped in a shape we call it Hatib. The word Hatib means to be satisfied. So this is Hatib. And this is one of the fashions for offering tables. And you can see that they have depicted some of the offerings, like a goose, a duck, bread, maybe beer and wine. And also sometimes they used to pour water as libation. So through this opening, it would go down the table. Mm -hmm. You like that sort of thing? Yeah. Um, this, I'm near this, was the governor of Waset, or Thebes during Dynasty 25. Dynasty 25 is John Henry Clark called our last great walk in the sun. It's begun by a man named Alara, 
and then a man named Costa, and then Pianchi, Shabaka, 25. Shabaka, Shabataka. All of these are important figures, and then um, Taharka. I believe it's in the reign of Shabaka that you have the creation story called the Memphite Theology recorded on stone. Yeah. In the reign of his successor, Shabataka, you have the introduction of the Demotic script. This is a writing system used for business transactions. And finally, Taharka himself. Now, uh, there, there are some people trying to put together an actual film called The Last Pharaoh, starring Will Smith, oh. about the effort of the Nubians or Kushites in Dynasty 25 to go to Jerusalem and rescue Jerusalem from the Assyrians. There is a close relationship with the Jews and the people of the Nile Valley at this time. And this sister is the actual biological sister of, of Pianchi and the auntie of Taharka. And it's very important to look at this. Not only is it well preserved, but we don't give enough attention to the sisters, to African women. And I came here, I think, three or four times <coughs> before somebody even pointed this chapel out to me. So go look inside. There are some excellent reproductions of the sister. And then you see for yourself. And how do you spell her name? What is it? A M E N I R. I mean, artists or Armin artists? Armin artists. Armin artists. I'll spell it for you later. Yeah, because. I'll I, give it to you in a book. I'm what? tired. Okay. Well, told me to tell you how. And she well, wants. Tell her, say hello. <laughs> she wants all the priestesses. And, uh, okay, well, the leaves are absolutely excellent. Mm -hmm. On both sides. On both sides. What was this other temple? What was this other temple? A chapel. A chapel. Oh, this was a chapel. And this dynasty only lasted about a hundred years, and it was finally overthrown by the Assyrians. And the Nubians retreated deep into the south, and they never really regained control of Egypt again. So this is a very important period. What's the average uh, length for uh, most dynasty? Of some rulership? dynasties last a couple hundred years or more. Wow. But some dynasties, like Dynasty Three, for example, 50 years. This dynasty lasted about 75 years, and then it's followed by Dynasty 26, which is really a kind of a Greek dynasty that was put in power by the Assyrians, and it crumbled too. And then the Persians come in, and ultimately Alexander in 332, and that starts the Ptolemaic dynasty in 304 BC. So that's it for us here. Okay. So she was the sister of Banki? The sister of Pianchi, and the auntie of Taharka. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, I'm learning. So we're all here.